Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this new webinar by the International Energy Agency. We are very happy to welcome you for a new session uh, within the framework of this capacity reinforcement program on energy data and energy modeling. So today we will enter more into details of the modeling of the supply sector after having discussed uh, earlier on how to model end use from the demand sector and we took the example of the building sector after having discussed transformation processes with the power sector yesterday so now today we will look more upstream to the supply uh, focusing on, on fossil fuels uh, so, so that we can uh, have a comprehensive view of all the, the modeling exercise so just to remind where we are on our course, uh, as just mentioned, we, we, we have seen uh, intro sessions on building and power sector as the days before. Today is focused on energy supply. Tomorrow, please note that we will start one hour later. So it will be 11.30 at this time. And we will have a, a wrap up session with a quiz and uh, many, um, many interactions to, to refresh all what we would have seen in the previous, uh, previous sessions. Tomorrow, we will have to use a lot menti.com. So please make sure you are able today, or if you've not yet, that you connect to, to Menti so that we can do those live polls. And then uh, by the end of the week, we will have additional sessions on, on modeling. So uh, I'm reminding the housekeeping rules, uh, we are doing online and trying to make as many interactions as possible. So please use the menti.com website for poll. Any question, please raise your hand and you can ask your questions when we have the Q&A uh, breaks, but also uh, throughout the, the entire presentation by using the Q&A box. So what are we gonna talk about today? So today, at the end of the webinar, you will, you will learn more about how for the supply um, modeling module, we work on price and demand supply iteration. Then we will present with more details the structure of the, of the fossil fuel supply model. So you will see uh, how it is organized and what are the sub modules. We will enter into more economic uh, consideration with NPV uh, calculation, net present value, production profiles and investments so that you can have an idea of uh, how investment decisions and how the economics behind uh, production of oil or gas work. We will focus on the refinery module. So how do we go from crude oil, for example, to end uh, oil products like gasoline? And last but not least, we'll discuss a very important question about sustainability of the fossil fuel uh, today. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, we will start with some questions for you to, to kick off this session. So I invite you to, to go to the www.menti.com website. So today, the code we will use uh, is the one you can see on the top part of the screen, And the first question we are asking you today is when starting an exercise of modeling the supply part of the energy system, what are to you the key parameters that we need to take account? Here we, you have several proposals, but with which do you most agree or disagree? Is um, demand one of the most important parameters? Is this prices, resources, reserve? Project profitability. So I give you some time to, to give your answers.
So if you have difficulties in, in joining the poll, just reminding the process, you need to, to go using your, your smartphone or the computer you are um, connected uh, with, uh, with today on this uh, webinar. And just visit the website www.menti.com and then just enter the code that uh, you can see on the top part of the screen. Okay, we are gathering more, more answers. So it seems um, it seem pretty, pretty balanced uh, so far. Uh, the number one parameter you are, um, you are mentioning are resources and then demand, then come project profitability, prices and reserves. So as you, as you may notice, there is indeed a, a difference between resources and reserves. We might come back to that later on in, in the presentation. Um, but um, demand is indeed a very key uh, parameter uh, to, to develop the modeling of the supply parts of this energy system. If I had to, to pick two, <clears throat> I, I might say demand and prices, but of course, all parameters are very important. So there is no right or, or bad answer here. So moving to, to a second question, in your opinion, um, are, you, are we close to reaching a peak in global oil production? You might have heard a lot about the, the oil peak, which was something that uh, was very, um, <clears throat> so, so, um, a concept very much discussed in the, in the previous years. Uh, so far, we've not experienced it when looking at the numbers of oil production at the global level, but in your opinion, is this coming very soon or <clears throat> not soon at all? I know that soon and not soon at all are a bit vague. I did not put uh, any years or dates on purpose, but uh, let's see what you what you think. Okay, so thank you for your answers. I would say that on average, you think it's uh, not that close to, to us. Uh, we'll also see in the presentation uh, more about this concept of peak in global oil production. Maybe one, one point we can uh, mention now is that uh, there are different type of oil resources. As you might have heard, uh, we, in the past, we were only looking at conventional oil Whereas it's been a few years, we have <clears throat> non-conventional resources, especially uh, shale oil or, or um, tide oil in, in the US, uh, which has really um, uh, reboosted the production. So to answer this question, we might have a, a closer look, look at what type of oil uh, we're looking at, because this might have been a game changer in uh, what we, we conceived as being the, the peak in production. And one last question before we shift to the presentation. So in, in a world under the sustainable development scenario, according to you, do we still need oil? So just reminding that the sustainable development scenario is one of the scenario developed by the, the IEA, uh, which is aligned with the Paris Agreement targets on climate of limiting global warming. <clears throat> to uh, two degree or making most efforts to, to limit to 1.5 degree by the end of the century. Uh, I'd like also to mention that we are working on a more ambitious scenario, which is called net zero by 2050, uh, that would enable to, to limit emissions even more and even faster. But the, the sustainable development scenario has been for a few years our, um, let's say, climate uh, scenario, again, so aligned with the international climate goals. And the question is, in this, in such a scenario where we limit um, global warming, when we limit uh, emissions, will, will we still need oil? Okay, 
to you. I think that there are a few few people who answered that we we won't need any more some oil. Some think we we will, and uh, on average, you, you you mostly think that we we will need somehow uh, a bit of oil in the sustainable development scenario. So <clears throat> we we will see the answer in the presentation again. Um, the answer might, might be yes and no, but mostly uh, yes in, in the short term. Uh, but again, we'll have more uh, more information on that in uh, in the coming slides. Thank you very much for your answers. Please using the the Menti. Sorry, can you can you still hear me, Zakia? If you can confirm me. Um, if some people have uh, difficulties in Menti, please feel free to reach out because tomorrow we will make the entire session working on on Menti. Okay, so back to the to the presentation. Okay, it's, it's, I'm sorry. It seems like there are some issues with the audio. Can you just I don't know, Dakia, if you can confirm that you you can hear me well? We can hear you, but it has changed. Um, Sorry, it looks like my audio device changed. Just asking you once again. Yeah, yeah is that better now? Uh, yes, much better. Perfect. Thank you. I'm sorry, my handset was disconnected. I don't know why. But OK, let's, let's continue. So before um, we start with um, the proper course on how to do modeling on the uh, supply sector. Uh, I'd like to take uh, some minutes to, to set the scene and looking at some, uh, some numbers and some, uh, some figures for the oil and gas sector in Africa. So let's first have a look at uh, upstream and resources, um, resources in, uh, available in, in the world. So on this figure, you can see global discoveries of, of oil and of natural gas over the last um, eight years, uh, per, and they are broken down per region. So Sub-Saharan Africa is a, are the red bars and North Africa are the blue bars. What you can see is that, um, well, of course, there are many variations of discoveries year after year, but if we look um, at the right part of the slide on natural gas, you can see that uh, Africa has accounted for a big part of recent discoveries of natural gas um, globally. And if we, if we make an average, looking at this period 2018, 2011 to 2018, Africa accounted for 40%, 4 zero, of global natural gas uh, di discoveries. <clears throat> and here we, we can have in mind uh, of course, uh, some resources in Eastern Africa, Mozambique, uh, Tanzania, as well as Western Africa, Senegal and, uh, and Mauritania, and also more recent resources in, in uh, South Africa. So there are gas that's been discovered uh, all across the, um, the continent. So this was <clears throat> resources. When we look at the outlook for production, According to our analysis, the production of oil at the continent is to remain stable. So here you can see the level in 20, 2018 with Africa producing a bit more than 8 million barrels per day <clears throat> of oil. Of course, there are some incumbents and very heavy producers that we all know in Sub-Saharan Africa. Those will be Nigeria and Angola. In North Africa, we have Libya and, and Algeria. But there are also newcomers uh, for the oil production, with oil expected to be produced in um, in Kenya and, and Uganda, for example, as well as in uh, in Senegal. But you see that for oil production, according to our projections, by 2040, the, the production will remain uh, mostly stable. 
This is a totally different picture when we look at natural gas on the right part of the slide. And this is very much related to what we discussed in the previous slide. Due to the huge discoveries that were made in the continent, we expect a very important growth of natural gas production in the continent with Mozambique and Tanzania, but also with Egypt and, uh, and others. While historic um, producers like Nigeria, Libya um, and Angola also continue and, and Algeria, sorry, also continue to have uh, an important part of the of the production. So this was upstream. Now let's try to have a look at a bit more um, more uh, aspect. So on this chart, you will have the prospect for several uh, oil indicators. The yellow line is oil production. So what we've just seen on the left part of the previous slide, but we are also looking at demand. Uh, here, which is the orange line. And what you can see is that we expect uh, oil demand to grow very strongly and to more than double uh, by 2040. This is due to uh, Africa's uh, urbanization, population growth, increasing needs for transport. So an increasing need for oil products like, like gasoline, for example. Then uh, on this chart, you can also see the net products imports, so uh, imports of uh, oil, oil products, and the refinery runs. And what, what you can see is that, uh, well, the refinery runs are to increase. So this is to say that uh, the ability to make uh, gasoline, for example, locally from, um, from uh, crude oil, so that to, to supply the local markets with oil products um, locally. But whatever you don't produce locally, you need to import. And this is why, considering the increase of oil demand, we expect also an increase of the import of products. And this is the blue, the blue part you can, uh, you can see on this, uh, on this part. So according to those analyses, Sub-Saharan Africa would remain a net importer of oil products through uh, 2040. So importing more oil products than the products which are um, produced and refined locally in the continent. Let's have a look at uh, economic implications. So here we have selected top uh, 10 producers in Africa of both oil and gas. And we are trying to look at the income for the government, for the country, from oil and gas resources. What is obvious is that uh, there is a lot of variation uh, over years which are very much due to um, the change in the oil prices, which as we all know is very volatile. But when you look at the government's expenditure, you can see that when oil uh, and gas products uh, and incomes rise, the government expenditure is also rising a lot. Uh, so there are more uh, in public investment, but also more, um, more um, expenses. But when you are in a period of decrease of uh, income, it's more difficult for governments to uh, shrink these expenditures. So there is really a big risk for those economies who rely a lot on their income uh, from oil and gas to manage carefully the public, um, the public budget. This is the historical situation. What could be the future? Again, here, a scenario approach is, is useful. And if we took the stated policy um, scenario, we could expect um, oil and gas incomes to come back to a level, but which is way less than what countries have experienced in the first, um, the first years of the 2010 decade. <clears throat> but if we are in another scenario with faster energy transition, and as a consequence, lower need for oil because for example globally let's say that europe the us china and india would shift more quickly from oil to um, electricity for transport with electric cars this would entail a lower demand for oil and gas and then it might mean that the incomes for african countries would be at a level which is as low as what it was in 2017 the, the record low level. So uh, this is just a, a strong message for, um, for producing economies to diversify because uh, it is less and less um, safe 
to, to rely only on oil and gas resources for their income. And one, one last uh, point, which is um, very connected to that, is that in, in a world with a lot of oil and gas producers um, and with more competition for resources, what will be key for producer economies if they want to uh, make the most of their resources is to uh, develop the project as quickly as possible. And the indicator we are looking at here is time to market. So um, what was the duration of, uh, um, of uh, being able to produce the first barrels of oil once that a discovery has been made? So this relates to um, all the admin uh, processes to be able to make the production, as well as the industrial development of um, of an oil uh, oil well, uh, and here what you can see is that on average uh, in the world the time to market has decreased a lot, uh, and it has decreased more in the world than for the the Africa uh, average. So there is, if African producers still want to have an important role in the global uh, market production of oil, they need to make sure that the resources are uh, quickly and efficiently developed and that the time to market is as short as possible to be to be competitive. I'm stopping here. Uh, there was just this was just a few slides of uh, introduction to this oil and gas topic. Uh, and now I'd like to to move to um, the more technical parts of this session on how to do the um, the modeling of supply and oil and gas. And for that, uh, you will hear from, from my colleague, uh, Rebecca, who will join us at the end of the webinar also for Q&A. But she will present to you more into details how the modeling exercise is, uh, is done. Hello and welcome to this subsection as we talk through supply modeling and specifically fossil fuel supply modeling in the IEA's world energy, uh, world energy supply model. In the course of this first section, we're going to detail more information and background on the prices and demand supply iterations that we go through in the model. We will step through first taking a look at the current picture of the, the oil and gas industry today. And what you see here is a view of the ownership of oil and gas, both the proven plus probable reserves, the production, and the upstream investment by company type from 2018. On the left-hand side, we see oil, and the right-hand side, we see gas. And this is broken apart by the industry landscape for oil and gas, and it's typically characterized into the majors, producers like Shell, Total, ENI, BP, ExxonMobil, and others, independents, um, companies like Tullo, the North American Shale Independents, including Oxy and EOG, and also national oil companies that are split between both independent NOCs and NOCs that are more closely tied to the states. Fossil fuels still can provide an opportunity for energy access under the right conditions. However, increasing attention and import is being paid to reducing emissions across the sector. NOCs on the whole account for well over half of global production and an even larger share of future and existing reserves. As we take a look at the, the view of remaining technical recoverable resources for both oil and gas, we'll step through the picture of gas first. Currently, we have about slightly less than 20% of total reserves, or sorry, total resources have been produced to date um, with oil. And oil is broken apart into conventional, extra heavy, and extra heavy oil and bitumen, tight oil, NGLs, so or natural gas liquids, and kerogen oil. On gas, much of gas is on the conventional side. Overall, we've consumed less than 20% of the oil and gas that's estimated to be developable. Significant sources and resources still remain, particularly in conventional and extra heavy oil or bitumen. And gas resources, previously thought as a waste stream many decades ago, have grown to be, a considered, to be considered a potentially important transition fuel as we look forward to clean energy transitions. Shown here is the resource breakout for both oil and gas. 
And overall, there's not a question of whether there are resources to develop. The question that we're going to dive into in this slide and future slides as we go through the course of this module is at what cost and what does future demand look like and how the balances of those two factors play into global supply. So we'll explore this in much of the discussion, but first turn to the question of emissions from oil and gas operations. Fossil fuels can provide an opportunity for energy access under the right conditions. However, increasing importance and attention is being paid to reducing emissions across the sector. In 2020, we've seen many countries, including China, Japan, and Korea, make net zero carbon ambition pledges. The IEA has analyzed emissions from oil and natural gas, including a recently updated methane tracker, which shows country and regional breakouts of the primary emission pathways. For oil and natural gas production, most emissions from operations are caused by the release of methane to the atmosphere. Methane on a 100 year lifetime has approximately a 30 times greater warming potential than carbon dioxide. And we estimate, based on our analysis, that more than 70% of these methane emissions could be abated at no net cost to the operator, or essentially could be captured um, and sold on as methane in the existing, in the existing operations. A long time area focus, flaring has received even greater scrutiny and attention in the last few years. In 2019, about 150 BCM of gas was flared, or more gas than is currently used by the entire continent of Africa. Flaring of associated gas occurs sometimes in the event of an emergency or a non standard operational event. However, most flaring occurs due to the lack of a gas market or infrastructure built directly to the operation site. Recent geospatial analysis by, um, by many individuals and highlighted by the IEA indicates that more than half of flaring occurs within 20 kilometers of existing gas pipelines. Further, if flares were unlit or operating in poor conditions, even more emissions than can even more emissions than are currently estimated may be released. We're going to step into next. We're going to step into next the IEA's world energy model and an overview of the supply model. As we turn to the supply model, we consider what must be taken into account in order to assess supply. Some of these key elements in the module include demand across the sectors, price, available resources, and the cost to produce those resources, or essentially the economic viability of the projects. Government policies in particular have a hand in driving demand for a product stream as they help to drive customers and consumers um, or help to set future CO2 pricing, for example. The price may be sufficiently stimulating to bring in new investments into a sector, and the price and supply are intricately linked and depend on resources, production costs, and overall policies. In the world energy model, we assess a price scenario that maintains a relatively static path forward. In reality, prices fluctuate and sometimes significantly. The World Energy Model assesses supply of fossil fuels, including coal, oil, and natural gas, as well as, tradition, as well as traditional and modern biomass. Demand is first assessed by sector and country and region, and global supply is then modeled. Import and export needs are assessed in the model, and trade is defined based on these demand needs and global access. Typical models in the IE World Energy Model contain three fossil fuel supply modules for oil, natural gas, and coal. Oil and natural gas are linked as many reservoirs contain heavier components and result in the production of natural gas liquids, or NGLs. These NGLs are incorporated then into the overall oil supply model. Oil as a global commodity is treated globally, such as supply and demand are in balance and natural gas and coal seek equilibrium in the model on a regional basis and are considered with regional demand and trade infrastructure constraints, and then the supply is equilibrated. Price iterations that we'll dive into in subsequent sections are needed to ensure that the price assumptions that are inputted into the model reflect sufficient return on investment. In the model itself, we're gonna look and, and explore more several of the different types of oil that are modeled as well as several of the different types of gas that are modeled. In the next section, we'll talk a bit more on both these details. 
First, a word on price trajectories. The World Energy Model takes international fossil fuel prices and the future pathways and trajectories and reflects the levels needed for sufficient investment in supply to meet demand. Prices, derived through iter prices are derived through iterative modeling and their trajectories, while they appear smooth, in reality are much more likely to be, to be volatile. The cost of supply by type of resource, location, and including technology learning curves varies for both oil and gas. This also considers how the relative risk investment of how the relative risk of investment changes depending on country or region. The price of oil or gas must be sufficiently high to encourage investments in supply to meet demand. Shown here, you can see the different price outlooks that were used in the World Energy Outlook in 2019. For the current policy scenario, and this scenario um, in light of the COVID pandemic was not utilized in our WIO 2020. It had reflected essentially a business case as usual that is not as applicable in the current environment. It shows the stated policy scenario or steps that reflect a pathway that takes into account all currently stated policies from governments and industry insofar as they are sufficiently detailed and robust to have a likely probability to, to be achieved. And then also the sustainable development scenario. In this scenario, the SDS works backwards from the energy related United Nations Sustainable Development Goals to achieve universal energy access for all, improve public health outcomes, and achieves a net zero emission um, by 2070 with about a 50% chance of limiting a temperature rise to 1.65 degrees. You can see the variations in oil price that are used and needed in each one of these scenarios. And while oil price varies widely and show the smooth trajectories here, they do reflect the different ways in which resources, costs, and, and policies all affect the supply demand balance. In this next section, we're going to dive deeper into the fossil fuel supply module, its structure and its submodules. Here, we detail the project resolution in the world energy model, in the, specifically in the oil supply module. In the WEM oil supply module, there are 10 distinct types of oil, some of which have finer detail than others. In the crude and enhanced oil recovery sections or subsections, uh, we detail further the onshore, shallow, deep, and ultra deep. Other categories, such as the Arctic, extra heavy oil and bitumen, kerogen, tight oil, all have varying distance, technology, or depth categories. Coal, coal to liquids, gas to liquids, and additives are assessed as well if sufficient price warrants. Overall, in comparison to the electricity module, the oil module is more flexible than that of electricity, but the structure that we've seen is quite similar. When we look ahead to gas, at first blush, the gas supply module appears more simplified. Currently, we're working to break apart the modules into more discrete subsectors similar to the oil module. The conventional gas module is broken apart into gas and Arctic gas, as well as unconventional gas, including tight gas, coal bed methane, shale gas, coal to gas, and hydrates. The overall structure of the module, and we're gonna highlight this on the oil supply module, it first fundamentally looks at global demand. The key inputs into the module, such as historical production levels, recently sanctioned projects, remaining technical recoverable resources, costs, including finding and development, lifting costs or our OPEX, uh, fiscal tax regimes, discount rates and decline rates all help to govern what remaining or excess demand needs to be covered. The module is an equilibrium model and will assess what further supply is needed based on the excess demand and project economics. It works the economic calculations based on what you've seen in the preceding two slides, and it ranks those projects according to NPV. Then it brings on these new resources according to that ranking, subject to any logistical or resource constraints. This loop is then repeated for all regions and all oil types or all gas types. Moving from, moving from the basics of 
the demand and supply model. We're going to also dovetail and, and talk more on the NPV calculations and the investment portion of the model. When we think about replicating investment decisions in the oil and gas industry, we take a similar approach as what happens in industry in the module itself and in the model itself. We look at the net present value calculation um, at a project level and then scale that up on both a regional and a global basis for oil and gas supply. Both the, both the supply and investment modules are our economic models. We treat investment as the level of capital that is spent to develop or maintain assets. Net present value calculations are the basis of the model as the model assesses the economic reward or loss of producing a set of resources. Let's first look at the variations in the economic model inputs by country and by region and also globally. Prices are assessed as we spoke earlier for on the oil side uh, with a global price. Gases see a different price regionally or by country depending on scarcity and cost to transport. Countries have a different tax treatment regime and we track those at the agency and team levels. Additionally, we assess the cost of capital per country and region and per resource type. This translates into an assessment of the investment risk in a country or region. Additionally, as we take a look at resources, we have different costs of supply that govern the outputs of the net present value calculation. And these are done based on the sub modules and the sub sectors in oil and gas that we saw in some of the preceding slides. The cost to produce these are impacted by learning, technology learning, by depletion, and also by inflation, which is in turn impacted by prices. Resource availability and trading and other constraints are also accounted for in the model as, we, as the model considers which projects to pick and select to develop in order to meet excess demand and build a view of global supply for oil and gas. Once the model has picked which projects to take forward, it then produces um, it then produces and makes the production profiles according to standards that we have set within the module itself based on country and region and also by access type and resource type. The resources selected for production are taken according to the standard profiles. These profiles are set up by reservoir type, extraction method, technology, and location. And shown here, we look at, a, we look at some examples from Deepwater US, pre-salt deep water Brazil, and you can see the differences there based on historical time to, um, historical time to uh, invest, develop, and bring on initial production. And then also an example of bitumen mining from Canada, which you can see takes some time to invest and begin production, but then has quite a slow and long plateau. These outputs are what define the production side in the supply module. Natural gas is facing a potential turning point in Africa. In North Africa, gas already meets around half of the region's energy needs. But in Sub-Saharan Africa, it has thus far been a niche fuel. The share of gas in the energy mix is around 5% or among the lowest in the world. Today, Africa accounts for about 4% of global gas demand and about 6% of global production. There are nevertheless several reasons to believe that the future of natural gas in Africa may be different from the past. In recent years, there have been a series of major discoveries in almost every part of the continent, notably in Egypt, in the Zurian adjacent fields, in East Africa, in Mozambique, in Tanzania, West Africa, in Senegal and Mauritania, and also South Africa. Between 2011 and 2018, Africa accounted for more than 40% of global gas discoveries. Together with LNG technology innovation, these developments could fit well with Africa's push for industrial, industrial growth and its need for reliable electricity supply. In the power sector, the rapid deployment of renewables leaves room for gas to grow as a flexible and dispatchable source of electricity. 
Outside the power sector, the successful industrialization rests upon the stable pro provision of energy, including for energy uses that are hard to electrify. So gas could be quite well suited to some of these needs. Much, however, will depend upon the pricing at which gas becomes available, the development of distribution networks, including small scale LNG production, and the financing available for infrastructure. In our projections, Africa, Africa becomes a major player in natural gas as a producer, a consumer, and as an exporter. Today, Africa as a whole exports a similar volume of gas as Australia, and the continent's gas demand is similar to the combined demand of Japan and Korea. Production declines are the key determinant for future investment needs. Here, we see the historical global oil demand going up to 2018. So we're just shy of 100 million barrels. Moving to the future, if we just invest in current supply, oh, sorry, if we do not further invest and just look at the declines from existing fields, you can see that there's still significant oil supply going out into the future for the next two decades. If we invest only in fields uh, or only in existing fields, so essentially brownfield production, then we can see that with a fairly minimal amount of investment, oil production still will be maintained quite significantly through the 2020s and the 2030s. To look at the needs in the sustainable development scenario, we can see global oil demand emphasized by the top of the green line here in the sustainable development scenario. We can see that there's still a significant amount of investment that's needed in order to meet demand, even in a more sustainable scenario. If we take a look at the stated energy, uh, at the stated policy scenario, there's still a, a, there is significantly more investment as well that's needed to both maintain the level of oil demand that we have seen over the, or, or project to see potentially in the next two decades. Okay, so moving back to the presentation, I would like to break now and see if you if you have any question on what has just been said. Uh, so again, feel free to to raise your hand or directly write your questions in the Q and A box. I would also like to mention that we will have um, the next IEA Africa University. So these monthly webinars uh, where we present a key report or some IEA findings. Next one in April will be on the, on the recently released OIL 2021 report. So you will also have an expert from the IEA working on oil markets uh, describing you what the latest trends have been. So, this will be on the second Thursday of the month of April. So if you're interested in, in understanding more the, the oil markets and the trends in the oil sector, uh, please uh, just uh, save the date for the second Thursday of, um, of April. Maybe to while you are writing your questions, to comment a bit the, um, in relations with the initial uh, Menti questions. So uh, regarding the the peak, as you um, as you may have seen in the in the slide, um, the peak uh, is not a question of reserve uh, and resources. It's more a question of when demand would peak and consequently when uh, production is to peak. And this is something very hard to, to predict. Um, this year, the IEA has updated all its scenario because uh, in the light of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, where we have seen an 8% decrease in oil, um, oil demand in 2020 compared to the previous year, this uh, might have impact on the longer term prospect for oil. 
But um, <clears throat> so again, the peak is more something related to, to demand uh, from what we, we observe. Reacting on the question uh, on do we need oil in a sustainable development scenario world, as you have just seen, uh, if we stop investing now, the production will not uh, be able to match the expected demand. So um, it is expected that we need to invest in existing fields plus invest in new fields if the demand is to um, is to remain as we as we projected then there are many uh, parameters that might change demand it can be behavioral change if people uh, for example fly less and take less uh, planes if people uh, shift more to um, bikes instead of cars or to public transportation if governments uh, take stronger policies for energy efficiency in the transport sector, for example, um, trying to limit the uh, the old cars with lower efficiency levels, but just importing more recent cars, for example. So there are many measures that can um, can drive the demand for oil down in the transport sector. Then oil is also very much demanding for petrochemicals and uh, make the use of plastic. So here unless we drastically change the way we use plastic, the IEA uh, do not expect that uh, the demand for oil in the petrochemical sector would, would uh, drop. But uh, again, many, these are hypotheses, so many, many futures are possible depending on, uh, on where we, we all want to go and the choices we make. Okay, I don't see any questions. So if you don't have questions for us, uh, I do have some for you, so I suggest we, we move back to Menti for uh, two more uh, poll questions. <clears throat> so this is more a question that we discussed uh, earlier on in the statistical uh, lessons on the refinery modules. So when measuring inputs and outputs to refinery, can we expect to have gains? So can we expect to have outputs which are above inputs? So imagine you are reading um, some um, uh, some report on a refinery. You, you have table with those numbers. Is it possible to have outputs higher than the inputs? Okay, so it's a very balanced uh, match so far. Uh, we have no uh, just uh, just above with uh, five votes. So it's um, the, re the, question, the answer would be it depends, uh, or it would be yes and no. It depends on the unit you are looking at. If we are looking in terms of energy value, the answer is no. So you cannot make more energy. Uh, so having uh, higher outputs than the inputs. But if you are looking in volume, you can have more production, so more uh, liters of oil products than the input liters of crude oil that you had in the refinery. So it's a question of looking at the, the unit uh, we are, uh, we are uh, discussing. And um, it's not possible in energy value terms, but it is possible in volume, uh, in volume units. Okay, so another question, which is an open question to, to, to you. you. You have heard from Rebecca that, uh, and we all know that the fossil fuel uh, supply industry is under scrutiny because of their, um, their weight in the emissions and their responsibility in, um, in uh, uh, climate change. 
according to you, uh, what can this industry do for sustainability, for aligning more with our climate goals, for being a more sustainable industry? So this is, of course, there is no right or wrong answer. It's more in, we are interested to hear from you and from your views on this, uh, on this difficult question. So we have a first answer, um, a very good answer on uh, the fossil fuel industry can decrease CO2 emissions. So um, indeed, this is the end goal. Being supportive for other energy industry, conducting energy audits for efficiency, loss reductions, putting saving potential. So. Um, Indeed, I think the end goal is indeed to, to decrease CO2 emissions, or we can even um, consider the notion of CO2 intensity. So how much CO2 is um, emitted, for example, for the um, production of oil barrels, for the production of natural gas. So this is one, uh, one target and one um, output to to, to get to as, as target and means to do that. Indeed, I think the, the idea of energy audit to increase efficiency, to reduce losses, to identify the saving potential are ways forward. Okay, we, we are getting many, uh, many answers. Uh, efficiency is indeed something that comes uh, frequently and it's indeed very key. Efficiency in the industrial uh, processes uh, and this can come from innovative solutions uh, that uh, help the, the processes to be to be more efficient, uh, providing adequate, reliable, and affordable energy. And indeed, there is also a key point in being in conformity with social and environmental requirements. So this might also um, shed light on the role that government can have by putting in place uh, rules, norms, and standards that the uh, industry needs to, to respect for their operations. And, um, and maybe one last uh, point I'd like to comment is a plan to, um, plan to different uses and promote decarbonization. This is also something very interesting and in that we are uh, witnessing somehow with big uh, oil and gas companies, majors, who are increasingly diversifying, investing in uh, in other energy um, energy uh, fuels, energy items. So there is indeed um, a key uh, a key role of the com the company corporate developments in broader scope to be able to accompany the um, the transition and the decarbonization of the entire economy. Last one, yeah, more research. So we discuss research, innovation, research and development to uh, maybe be, be more efficient and have, uh, I guess, more calories for the same unit of, uh, of oil product. Thank you very much for, for your suggestions. There is one point that you, you have not mentioned explicitly, and that was discussed in the presentation and to which we will come back later on, is on methane. Uh, there is increasing scrutiny on methane emissions from the oil and gas upstream sector and uh, Rebecca will uh, will present that into into more details just uh, right now
In the next section, we're going to detail and step through the refinery module in a finer detail. In the refining model, we look at the key link between oil demand and supply. The module itself is, is broken up into four steps. We're going to detail some of these uh, further in the next slide. First, on project oil demand, we carry eight categories. And we also look at refined products demand, the overall project refinery runs. And then from these, we calculate a regional trade balance for both crude oil and for oil products. On the right hand side, you see what we typically output for the world energy investment, looking at the refining capacity and runs by region. And in this case, from 2019's new policy scenario. First, on the, on the oil products demand. We assess oil demand for each sector in a region from the demand modules and from those that we looked at earlier. Those are broken down for each oil product. So for ethane, naphtha, kerosene, fuel oil, LPG, gasoline, diesel, and also for other side products. There are some exceptions built within the categories. And those are for LPG, gasoline, and diesel, where we do some calculations outside and bring into the model based on different ways that some of these products are made. These are all worked and based on historical shares and also on some additional modeling that is needed in order to assess what are currently in marine bunkers and future, pro future projections for that. Diesel, gasoline, and LPG demand are worked in the road transport module and then transferred and put back into the refining module. LPG demand itself is also assessed in residential cooking and is determined by the access model. Project refined products demand takes a look further into the refinery runs and those are modeled to meet projected demand for refined products at each product level. The refined products demand equals the refinery runs plus any processing gains. We show here the detail for total liquids and within this we have a buildup based on biofuels, total oil, broken apart into CTL, GTL, but also the direct use of crude oil, overall oil products, and then finally refinery products. Project refining capacity is built and assessed for 112 countries in the world energy model. This is built into and split into the crude distillation units and also the condensate splitters. All of these take a look at the model product yields and meet projected oil products demand on a, on a global and also then a regional basis. Determine refinery runs or utilizations are based on regional cost competitiveness and also on product trade balances. These are pulled together and we also take a look at the refining capacity at risk or essentially what level of capacity may not be needed to meet current and future supply. These are taken into a regional trade balance for all of the crude oil and oil products. And we looked at the trade and we look at the trade matrices of these and how trade can move between these different regions. The crude oil or the refinable liquid side looks at the crude and condensate supply. It's, it takes this, it subtracts off the refinery intake, subtracts off the direct use of crude, and that equals the net import and export requirements. Oil products, on the other hand, look at the refinery output. They include product output from NGL or natural gas liquid fractionation plants, subtract the oil products demand, and this looks at net import and export requirements. And these are done on a regional basis to come up with an assessment of the overall global crude oil market and also the product markets. The demand for oil products has shifted over the last several decades. The past challenge for refiners has been reducing from the bottom of the barrel. However, when we look at future, future demand, the challenge becomes more to increasing yields from the top of the barrel products, particularly as we look 
at product demands that are being pulled and used for, for the petrochemicals industry and for the plastics industries. In the last section of this module, we're going to take a look at the implications for sustainability in the oil and gas sector and particularly on climate sustainability. If operated to reduce emissions, oil and gas could be an important source of energy for much of Africa and could enable Africa to take a more significant global role in oil and gas production. Increasingly, as more governments have announced carbon reduction ambitions, including China, Korea, Japan, the EU, the question of emissions, intensity of supply and imports becomes even more important. The emissions intensity of the oil supply curve is shown here. We take a look at the estimated scope one and scope two emissions for the overall crude oil, condensate, and natural gas liquid production from 2018. And as we look at this, and we look at the emissions intensity of this oil supply curve, we see that emissions from operations, including flaring and methane release, as well as emissions from transport and refining contribute to the overall scope one and scope two emissions from operations and transport. From this, we can also see that a relatively narrow band of production contributes an inordinately large proportion of emissions as you look from about 85 million barrels a day and above. Extracting oil, processing it, and bringing it to consumers is an important component of global greenhouse gas emissions today. And overall, these emissions are between 10 to 30% of the full life cycle emissions intensity of oil. And turning the picture to natural gas, the same applies to natural gas. With natural gas, methane leaks to the atmosphere are by far the largest source of emissions on the journey from reservoir to consumer. Increasing attention by governments and non-government agencies have shined a light in particular on methane emissions. The uptick in aerial surveillance, including satellite surveillance, has helped to understand where many of the larger leaks are sourcing from. Work by the Environmental Defense Fund and several other parties has also indicated that poor flaring combustion efficiency may be a major source of methane leaks, particularly from the oil sector. These considerations, also in light of the increasing number of country ambitions to reduce carbon emissions, puts into question the need and the importance of addressing emissions in new and existing operations. Looking forward to the future, it may be the case that lower emission oil and gas may be a preferred opportunity in the global market. When we look at overall scope one and two emissions intensity of oil and natural gas production in the sustainable development scenario, we can see that methane is the number one source of potential emission reduction and abatement. The IEA estimates the IEA estimates that about 70% of methane can be abated at no net cost. The use of CCUS or carbon capture use and storage in renewables can also help to reduce or offset emissions. Additionally, energy efficiency improvements have played a role in recent years to reduce emissions and improve efficiency and costs of oil and gas operations. Oil and gas operations on the whole account for over 4.3 million tons of CO2 equivalent released today. So nearly 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions. A large part of these emissions can be brought down relatively quickly and easily. The future is increasingly electric. However, liquids and gas still comprise over 50% of energy consumption to 2040. This also includes a role for low carbon liquids and gases, including some biofuels and hydrogen as well. When we look in the state of policy scenario towards the end of the 2030s, we see about $1 trillion invested in liquids, liquids and gases. 
that's reduced in the sustainable development scenario to just under $600 billion, with an increasing proportion and increasing need for low carbon liquids and gases. Overall, as we step towards the end of this module, we're going to leave you with the following conclusions. First, modeling fossil fuel supply requires information and assumptions on reserves and resources, technologies, production profiles, costs, tax regimes, many of the parameters for the NPV calculations, and including refinery, in order to assess a full supply model. Prices are needed to balance supply and demand and help to ensure that new investment is pulled into the sector. But as we model the prices, we need an iterative approach and real pricing may be much more volatile than the ones that we, we project and use in our modeling. New projects are needed to come online to offset declining production. And this is needed in both more sustainable scenarios, such as a sustainable development scenario, and also increasingly then in the stated policy scenario. Detail on primary and secondary products depend on the model requirements. The evolution of infrastructure can play a very significant role in this, in this regard. And today, about 15% of global energy-related greenhouse gas emissions come from the process of getting oil and gas out of the ground and to consumers. Minimizing these emissions should be a order priority for all companies and countries. No oil and gas company will be unaffected in clean energy transitions. So every part of the industry, including national oil companies, need to consider how to respond. Okay, so now that we have seen this uh, last section on uh, the refinery models and sustainability, I would like to move to a small Excel exercise, which will be an illustration of what we, you have just seen in terms of how to make energy modeling and uh, projections for the oil and gas uh, sector. So let me share with you one exercise. Uh, Maybe Zakia, can you confirm if we if we can see properly my screen? Yes, I can see. Perfect. Thank you very much. So um, this uh, small exercise is um, related to the well to the oil and gas sector, and we are, as we always do, uh, making a lot of simplification. But let me give you the the, the scene. So we are looking at a country uh, where well there are cars on the roads and there is demand for, for oil products, we we'll simplify assuming that there is only one oil product, which is gasoline. Then we consider that this country has some domestic production of crude oil. So this is an oil um, producing country. And there are some refineries in the countries. Um, as, you, as you will see in the next questions, refineries are not um, able to, to product all the gasoline which is needed in the country. So there are imports of um, gasoline products and the domestic production of crude oil is not uh, sufficient uh, neither to, to fill in the, um, the refinery. So there is also imports of crude oil. So here uh, we will have some first questions in order to understand better the today's situations and the past trends. So as we always say, before being able to do projections and looking to the future, we need to understand very well uh, the historical data and the, and the past. So the first question we are asking ourselves is, uh, what are the crude oil uh, inputs to refineries? knowing that refineries have uh, some um, levels of losses of 5%. So you were given here the refinery um, output, and we are also given this 5% uh, refinery losses. So we can deduct just by a direct, form, direct um, division that the crude um, oil inputs to refinery is the output divided by 
one minus five percent. So you can see that um, there is also a higher input in the refineries than the the output. And here we can check that our number is is consistent because we know the total um, input to the refinery we've just calculated here. We know the domestic production of crude oil and the import of crude oil. So the addition of domestic production of crude oil and imports of crude oil needs to be uh, equal to the um, crude oil input to the refinery. And according to our formula here, our check is okay. Then the next question we are asking ourselves is about the refinery capacity factor. So the capacity factor is based on the refinery output and the refinery capacity. Here on this exercise, the refinery output was given in kilotons of oil equivalent, but the capacity was given in kilo barrel per day. So you need to make a conversion to bring the refinery capacity uh, into uh, kilo TOE. Uh, and once this is done, you can easily calculate what the refinery capacity factor and looking at those historical data, we can see that the capacity factor has been decreasing slightly over, over years from 60% to 57%. So now we have a better um, assessment of uh, this oil and gas, uh, oil, sorry, uh, activity in this country with uh, how refinery run, uh, what are the level of imports, uh, demand, etc. Building on that, we can try to make projections to assess what different futures could, could look like. And in the next question, we'll try to anticipate what will be the imports of, uh, of oil, both crude oil and gasoline, and to deduct what is the import dependency. So this is a key question for policymakers to be able, based on the demand for um, from the transport sector, based on the activity of the refineries, to be able to anticipate what the imports will be, what the dependency will be. So first, let's estimate what the imports of gasoline will be. So uh, to do that, we, we have our historical data and we need to take some assumptions on how some parameters will evolve. So here, we are given a few assumptions uh, on the refinery capacity. It is said that the refinery capacity will grow at a pace of uh, 0.1 kilobarrel per day every year from historical level. So this is uh, how we calculated the future, uh, the future level of uh, refinery capacity with this increase based on uh, previous years. Refinery capacity factor, it is also given that we aim to reach a value of 70% by 2030. So this can be a target given by the government, for example, to, to reach such number and to implement the, the right, um, the right um, measures to reach this target. So here we fill in 70% and we can deduct year after year what is the, the rate based on a, on, a growth, um, on a compound average growth rate. Once that we have the refinery capacity and refinery factor, we can deduct what the refinery output will be. So just pay, paying attention to the unit and making a conversion, but we know that um, the refinery outputs equals the refinery capacity multiplied by the refinery capacity factor. So here we can check that our calculation are consistent with uh, the numbers we had just here. But the beauty of our model is that we can draw the, the formula to the future and get some, um, some updated some numbers of projections. And from there, we can deduct the imports of gasoline because we know the demand for gasoline in the, in the transport sector. This was given uh, in line 11, both for historical and for projections. So we can deduct that uh, the uh, imports of gasoline is the total demand minus what is the output from the refinery. So this was for gasoline. We can do the same exercise for crude oil 
And here again, we are given some, uh, some hypotheses on refinery losses. So we have, um, we have a target of uh, reaching 3% refinery losses by 2030. So again, we will see the rate decreasing over time. We, we have also um, some, we, we are given an assumption on how domestic production of crude oil will increase. So we, we can see this evolution. Calculating refinery outputs based on, on the losses, we can then deduct what will be the total imports of crude oil. And then summing imports of gasoline and crude oil, we will have, um, we will be able to, to calculate the import dependency. So those numbers and those projections can be seen in, in the chart here. And what is interesting, as we, as we always do, is we can do some sensitivities analysis. What if I change my, um, my hypothesis? What if by 2030, my refinery capacity factor is not at 70%, but at 80%, we can see that the imports are, uh, are reduced. So this was um, on the, <clears throat> on the uh, refinery uh, productions and on the, on the imports. Now let's have a, a quick look at how production in the country might evolve to match this, um, this demand. As, we, as we've discussed in the, in the presentation, uh, oil fields are not like uh, power plants. You cannot say once you have built your, um, your hydropower dam or your, um, your gas, um, your gas uh, power plant that you want to run it at a certain level. It all depends on the production profile of the field. And these are predetermined and these are uh, based on certain profiles. So when you invest in one field, you will have certain level of oil being produced years after years uh, that you need to, to take into consideration. And here the question is, knowing how the existing fields um, will, uh, will uh, evolve and how their production will change over time, where, what is the additions we need to, to get? What is the extra crude oil production we, we need to add if we want to, um, to match the target of uh, domestic oil production? And here we'll go very, very quickly on that, but we can have first a look at um, how the production of the 2018 uh, production evolved. So we were given here some, some numbers on uh, the evolution of the field outputs. So we knew that in 2018, uh, there was a domestic production of eight kiloton uh, equivalent. And that uh, in the following years, and we can look years after years, there is a declining profile. So from there, we can, we can calculate how much production from this field will come online in the following years. And we can uh, deduct what is the addition which is needed if we want to reach the number we had, our target of total domestic crude oil production. And then the interesting, uh, the most interesting part is to look for every production uh, field we invest in. There is this production profile of the capacity. So if we develop um, uh, a new field in the year 2019, we um, expect to have 3% uh, of its uh, production coming the first year, then 4.5 the second year, et cetera, et cetera. So over the, the entire course, like we assume 30 years, of the field production. And this goes for each year where we uh, develop a new, a new field. So I will let you uh, look more at the, um, at the calculation details, but um, basically we will, we will uh, define based on the additional uh, crude oil production additions that we, that we need, uh, how this will be um, ventilated over the different uh, fields which are developed over a year, taking into consideration the production profile. I, I'm stopping here for the exercise, but of course you will uh, get the solutions so that you can enter more into the, the formula and have a, a deeper look at, uh, at it.
And now I'm very happy to, to open for more uh, more questions and answers. And I think we, we have uh, Rebecca who just uh, joined us. So Rebecca, uh, who is our expert on uh, oil and gas uh, and who uh, who you heard uh, presenting the, the previous um, sections. So uh, I'm inviting you to to ask any, any questions we've not been able to address uh, so far and to really take the opportunity of having Rebecca uh, and, uh, and her strong expertise also coming from the industry uh, to, um, to ask any, any question on this topic. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Arnaud, how are you? Good, thank you. Thank you for, thank you for the invitation to join today. No, a, a pleasure. So, well, we have a first question on the Excel file. Uh, I'll make sure that everyone receive indeed the, the questions and the, and the solution. If we don't get questions, I, I might have some for you, Rebecca. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we, we won't keep silent. And to, to the participant, again, feel free to raise your hand and you can directly um, take the floor and, and speak up. There is no, you can send your questions by the Q&A box, uh, writing them down, or you can speak up. While participants are um, writing the, down their questions, Rebecca, may I ask you maybe the latest uh, work um, your team has been working on uh, on the oil and gas side or the latest uh, modeling trends you have been uh, observing? Absolutely. It's been, it's, it's been quite busy, as, uh, as you can imagine, coming off of a very busy 2021 and trying to understand the impacts of the pandemic and COVID. Um, and also, when, especially within the oil and gas industry, there have been a number of, of trends in increasing targets and ambitions by, um, by industry, both uh, by majors that are producing oil and gas, but also by many international and national oil companies as well. And so we're currently working on the net zero roadmap to 2050. Um, which will be coming out on May 18th and taking a look at the oil and gas supply side of that um, and what that means for the future. But in addition, we're also working on a number of other analyses, um, including our critical minerals approach and trying to understand uh, critical minerals supply going into the energy transition, as well as trying to understand investment trends globally, but also more specifically finance and investment in, uh, in emerging and developing economies. And looking at that um, across a number of clean energy sectors, but also oil and gas and how that's developing. So, so many, many things going on. Um, we, we just received the first question, which relates more, I think, to the Excel exercise. And the question is, if we have missed observation, can we do imputation or any other method to fill the data? So if this relates to historical data, um, this is something we, we discussed a bit with, with Dakia on the statistical um, trainings on what are the different methodologies to, to fill the gaps if you have some, uh, some missing, uh, missing data and some, um, some, uh, some gaps. Uh, there are several um, methodologies and uh, you should not be shy to, to revise historical data always explaining why and how, but uh, this is a common practice to, um, as we, we gather more, more data, as we are able to improve uh, estimations on how to fill historical gap, uh, historical revision is something that can be done. Uh, I don't know, Zakia, if you want to, to maybe add a bit more on, uh, on such practices to, to fill uh, historical data. I think you've outlined it quite well, Arnaud, as well. Um, essentially, and especially in the IAs, we're continuously getting more input and more data in every year and trying to understand the, the flows and balances of, of each individual um, fuel supply. We're continuously looking and, and needing to revise those. Um, but I think the key point that you had raised, Arnaud, is the one to, to flag, is to make sure that as you're doing the work that you're highlighting, 
what assumptions you're carrying into the modeling itself, um, if not explicitly in the data, so that others understand that and can follow that as well, and not just for yourselves, but for the for the ones that come after you as well. Exactly. Maybe we can have a look, uh, Rebecca, at the. Um... If you see on my screen, the last question on Menti we, we asked participants was, what can the fossil fuel supply industry do for sustainability? So there are a few, um, a few proposals. I, I commented it uh, a bit. There were many, um, many suggestions related to, to efficiency, but also um, trying to develop plans for decarbonization. I don't know if um, those suggestions uh, resonate or uh, make sense to what you are observing uh, from your position looking at the at the industry. These are these are really excellent. Um, I'm just I'm just reviewing them um, as we go through, and I think it helps to take into context some of the points that we had earlier in the slides, but are especially important. Um, if you look at historical, well, how the oil and gas sector um, has been a critical part of energy. That will remain into the future, although we are continuing to grow and expand in, in many other uh, many other energy supply types. Within oil and gas, more specifically, the points here on sustainability really look at trying to understand and reduce the emissions that are coming from the sector, particularly in upstream, um, as we look at our scope one and our scope two emissions. And within that context, um, the greatest emissions that we have are due to, to methane leaking and venting, uh, and also due to flaring. And flaring is more particularly done where we have oil production and we don't have uh, a gas market for the associated gas to that, um, for that oil, that related oil production. And so trying to both um, abate the methane leaks and a lot of this coming from preventative maintenance um, taking a very active approach at understanding when the leaks are coming, getting out there quickly to fix them. Um, and there's new digitalization um, and new drone technologies and new ways of working that are starting to address that. And then on the flaring side, there's a number of opportunities um, that have been coming, especially in the last few years, to come with more innovative approaches to how to address flaring. Um, and we're continuing to do more research into this area as well. Um, so reducing the two of those quite considerably are, are two of the big, um, let's say, levers um, that we can do to help reduce emissions from the oil and gas sector. And, and also uh, because we will be reliant on, at least, uh, on it for at least you know, some time moving into the future. And so trying to reduce the scope one, scope two emissions from that um, will ultimately help to reduce um, all of the energy. Uh, energy emissions that we have coming overall from the sector as we bring on new types of, of energy supply and systems. Thanks for, for those insights. There is one question on refinery capacity factors that maybe you can explain more, but before that, if we are still on the, on the Menti, um, maybe you could also comment because we ask participants uh, if in their opinion, we'll still need oil in a sustainable development scenario. I briefly mentioned that we are developing uh, a more climate ambitious scenario, which is a net zero uh, mm -hmm. scenario. Do we also expect to need oil and to what extent in this, uh, in this more ambitious scenario? Okay. Um, perhaps I can take that question first and then I'll go to the question of refinery capacity factor second. Um, within, within WEO 2020, we looked at um, how much oil we need in, in an SDS type of scenario and also in a step scenario. And if we were to, as a global society, if we were to stop investing in additional oil um, from today, let's say, by the mid 2020s, the oil fields globally would decline to about half of what they are producing today. If we just invest in, in brown fields, um, so essentially not investing in any new fields, but continuing to invest in the fields that we have, that brings on about another 20 million barrels per day by 2040. Even in the SDS scenario though, we need an additional about 20 million barrels a day of new production um, and new exploration coming on by 2040. And then in additionally, there's even more that would be needed for the steps. So, so Yes, we do need some additional development um, and new development in oil to achieve the SDS, but the new development we need 
does need to be lower in emissions than, um, than the full supply chain uh, situation that we currently have today. And so we're increasingly look that um, the new SDS supply that comes into 2040 needs to be a lower emitting supply. And with the question with regards to refinery capacity factors. Just Rebecca, if that might be helpful, I can sure. broadcast the, the slides of the refinery um, sections. Sure, I'll wait for you to circle that one up. Okay, so here were the steps. And please let me know if you want that uh, I navigate through the different slides. Okay. Um, so the question that we have is from where or how to get a refinery capacity factor itself. And so total capacity is the, the overall refining capacity that we have within uh, a country or region or globally itself. And, and that we, we and along with the companies, um, but also the countries themselves, help to report some of that data into the IEA. The capacity factor then is defined by, by how much of that capacity is actually used to, um, to develop um, and to create and to generate the refined output um, and the refined, uh, um, the overall refining um, supply that we have within any individual country or region or globally as well. So we're taking and, and coming up with that number by looking at what capacity we have within a country, region, or globally, um, and then dividing and then um, having that uh, or dividing that by the overall uh, capacity that we see that's actually um, or supply that's actually being run out of that same country or region. Okay. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for the clarification. So I was mentioning and, and uh, I do it again to participants that we will soon have an IEA Africa University on the recent oil market uh, 2021 that will be presented by our colleague uh, Olivier. Uh, yeah, so yeah. the, there will be there will, you will receive more uh, more insights and information on the recent development of the global oil market. And we'll do our best to to focus as much as possible on the situation in Africa, both for um, OPEC, uh, OPEC plus producers, as well as for non-OPEC uh, oil producers, as we mentioned, uh, Senegal or, um, or Kenya and Uganda, who have uh, important uh, oil projects in the, in the pipeline. But this, uh, this report is also looking at the entire industry, so production, refinery, demand. So if you have some, some questions uh, that, you, that come across a bit later on, you will still have another window to discuss with an uh, oil expert within the within the AEA. Okay, so maybe if there are no additional questions, uh, we can close here. So you you can go for lunch a bit earlier than the previous days in in Ethiopia. And uh, I'd like to, to thank you very much, Rebecca, for having joined us for um, for this uh, last Q and A session and for your your clear exp explanations in the in the video. And uh, I'd like to thank all participants for your for your attendance. Feel free to, to reach out per email for um, any questions or to, to send us uh, by email also questions you you might have, but uh, did not an um, opportunity to, to ask now. So thank you, Rebecca. Thank you all. Thank you. And wishing you a very good day.